Roger Wilson was eight years old when his family moved to Boca Ciega Bay. As he grew, Roger witnessed the effects of dredging on what was previously a healthy aquatic habitat. He heard stories told by fishermen and old-timers lamenting the disappearance of fish, shrimp, oysters, clams, and scallops. Roger attended Pinellas County Public Schools and Florida State University. He completed military service as an Army Ranger Special Forces soldier. In 1968, he campaigned and was elected to serve in the Florida House of Representatives. Today I smile a little bit to myself when I hear people say, oh, it's scallop season, let's go up to Homosassa or Crystal River. Because it reminds me that when I was a kid, we used to go scalloping off of John's Pass on the healthy grass flats that were then available. I, and I've often thought, people ask me, you know, how, how did you become such a passionate conservationist? Well, so after thinking about it uh, some years ago, I, I, I realized that it happened when I was a youngster growing up at John's Pass. And John's Pass in the 40s, and even a little bit into the 50s, was a pristine, truly pristine fishing village. And it was a great place for a kid to grow up. And I remember hearing uh, some of the older guys, uh, like the, the 30 and 35 year old guys that had come home after WW2, after the war, either because they lived here or they'd been in Florida for training. And they would, they would talk like they noticed there was a change taking place. I realized that when you have a label that says, uh, you know, Bogusega Bay is a national example of how not to dredge and fill, and you could see that. Grass, essentially, dredging and filling involved picking up one grass, healthy grass flat and putting it on top of another one. If there are any mangroves in the way, don't worry about it, we'll just cut them down. And you wait a few months for all the soil to settle, for the water to drain out, uh, and they'd put a dike up around the area that they wanted to uh, fill with uh, outlets, box, like little box outlets. Uh, they weren't so little, they were maybe four feet wide and maybe eight or ten feet long and they would have planks in the middle that they could drop in and make a, like a little dam but as the water drained out from the you know pumped in land um, they would elevate you know these planks and pretty soon you got to the top and you realize well okay everything's you know drained out and we can just wait another month or so and we can put houses on it and by the way when you create a finger fill you interrupt the natural tidal flow that moves through mangrove roots and, and moves in a flushing action. Now, instead of a flushing action, uh, the finger fills and other dredged in land area has an up and down tidal flow. That's why at the head of a canal that's in between the finger fills, sometimes we'll have floating debris in there because it's the, the, the current is not flushing. It's just stagnant. It goes up and down. What one generation of public officials a do doesn't really come to roost until the next generation of public officials comes along. It was a new idea um, and the developers didn't like it so it was controversial uh, truthfully um, and, uh, I, and I have to admit I borrowed the idea from the upland uh, activity because we had hunting preserves we had natural preserves so I said well if we have that why can't we have an aquatic preserve and that's how that transition was made. And um, I, it, it, it was controversial. And I, I don't want to go into too much detail, but it, it, uh, one night in, in front of the Senate chambers, it almost became physical. One, one of the developers really got upset. And it was because he owned some upland as well as some submerged land, and he wanted to expand his property. Some of the older people in the legislature, some of the older guys, they said, well, do what you can now, Roger, but you know, maybe come back in a couple of three years and do some more if you want to. And you know, it was kind of like a little bit of a trade-off to get the bill passed. I said, okay, fine. So in 1972, um, the entire county was put in an aquatic preserve. And so now today we've got 41 aquatic preserves around the state. And uh, it's done in order to preserve, to first you've got to repair then you know you know repair re restore and maintain these natural resources and it's the irony of it is it, it's for the benefit of the people who live here or the people who come to visit us and, and it's interesting if you just measure the coastline it's about 1200 miles but if you measure the coastline to include the bays and inlets 
it all of a sudden jumps up to 8,000 miles. So Florida has a lot of coastline and we need to protect it. You know, once you ruin it, it's gone. There's no more. Um, and so you, you need to preserve it. And, and one of the things you have to constantly do is educate people. And I've been surprised over the last three or four months of how few people know that we even have a state aquatic preserve system. And so it's a, it's a constant uh, marketing, if you will, that we have an aquatic preserve system here in Pinellas County and it's throughout the state and it's done to preserve or repair first and then preserve our natural resource for the benefit of the people who live here as well as the visitors. Uh, natural resource protection in Florida is critical. I would like to see more uh, local officials become conservation oriented, uh, dedicated to, to realizing that there are limits and we need to be aware of the importance of our natural resources. And, and again, I, 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 I remember hearing conversations when I was just a little kid down at Johns Pass uh, involving the older people who were fishing, be it commercial or, or sports fishing. They were noticing a change. I mean, when you dredge up one glass, <coughs> grass flat and put it on top of another one and you eliminate a mangrove island in the process, you got to think, well, wait a minute. There's no place for the birds to go. There's no place for the, the little aquatic life to grow up or to start. Everything that happens in the Gulf of Mexico, either directly or indirectly, began in our bays and inlets. So what we do here at home influences the Gulf of Mexico. I'm not that old, you know. <laughs> but, you know, from 69 to 19, it's 50 years. In 1969, the Florida Legislature initiated a new program within our state. A trajectory of unfettered degradation by dredge and fill was halted. Boca Ciega Bay became the first aquatic preserve in Florida to be established by legislative action. More designations followed. Now, Florida has 41 aquatic preserves managed by the Florida Coastal Office of the Department of Environmental Protection. Tampa Bay's four aquatic preserves include nearly 20% of the 2.2 million acres designated statewide. Most of the underwater habitats of these preserves are out of sight, but we all benefit from the seafood, clean water, and other natural products and services they provide. Management of each aquatic preserve is based on science and on specific site conditions. Scientists, decision makers, and local citizens play an important role in identifying and addressing issues. Aquatic preserve staff help coordinate habitat restoration and public education projects related to coastal ecosystems. They are on the front line to identify and address issues. We all work together to maintain the health of our underwater backyard.